Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to welcome you, our viewers, friends, and colleagues from all over the world to join over what we hope to be two inspirational days discussing a topic worth having. My name is Fatma Ibrahim. I'm an assistant manager at Expo Live, Expo 2020 Dubai. And I'm Arhama Shamsi, content lead on innovation at Rewired. Welcome to Rewired X, a virtual conference taking place alongside the one-year countdown to Knowledge and Learning Week at Expo 2020 Dubai. Rewired X plans to enhance knowledge sharing and connectivity between education stakeholders by sharing, discussing, and debating perspectives and real-life experiences in response to COVID-19. And that being said, and through recognizing the numerous conferences and webinars that have taken place since March of 2020, Rewired X is keen to bring new perspectives and new voices to the table, ensuring a substantive, engaging, and a truly global conversation. As such, the team behind Rewired X has been mindful not to curate a program where nothing new is being said. Over the next two days, we encourage you to make the most of your time here to learn from, inspire, and explore synergies amongst new and unlikely allies, as is the spirit of Rewired. And that's right, Hamam. It really is looking like it's going to be an amazing event, inshallah. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our platform to our viewers. We are currently in the main plenary room. This is where our main high-level plenaries will take place. You can also find your way into four separate breakout rooms where our breakout and spotlight sessions will take place. In the main lobby, you can also find our agenda to keep track of the sessions you would most like to attend. And in addition to that, the main lobby also hosts our networking lounge, where you can take a break from the sessions and chat with other attendees that are coming from different parts of the world. Don't forget to visit our information booth if you have any questions. And please note that all sessions will be recorded and they're gonna be available on demand on the platform a few minutes after they conclude. And if you're on social media, we encourage you to share your experience using hashtag rewired and hashtag rewired X throughout the conference. Thanks for that, Fatma. And now we have an engaging and action-packed agenda co-designed by our partners from around the globe. On day one, which is today, we'll focus on taking stock around what we have learned over the past year, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Day two, tomorrow, we'll focus on looking ahead to 2021 and what could and should be prioritized to rewire education for a prosperous and sustainable future for all. To start off, please enjoy this short video from Expo 2020 Dubai on the one year countdown to Knowledge and Learning Week. What an exciting time being exactly one year away from the actual Knowledge and Learning Week at Expo 2020 and the Rewired Summit. It is exciting indeed, Arhama. We at Expo are honored to have Rewired as our flagship Knowledge and Learning Week partner. And now it's time for the opening remarks from His Excellency, Dr. Tarek al Girg, the CEO of Dubai Cares. Thank you, uh, Fatma, and thank you, Arhama. Um, excellencies, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is a, an absolute pleasure for me to welcome you to Rewired X. I apologize in advance for my voice as I got a sore throat yesterday and I hope I deliver well. It actually seems appropriate for us to meet this way through a virtual grid screen at the end of a year when this has in fact become the prime means to face-to-face uh, uh, -face contact for professionals, colleagues, friends, and even families. Um, I'm expecting someone to tell me that I have forgotten to unmute at any point. Um, a word that will probably become the word of the year 2020, but my team assures me that you should all be able to hear me. Um, it is indeed true that COVID-19 has introduced an entirely new words into our daily lives, such as uh, social distancing, lockdown, 
venting, as well as re-emphasize the importance of everyday things such as uh, toilet roll papers, and got us hooked on TikTok, and the game Among Us, and the list goes on. Um, we have also started listening to songs that we would never listen to, such as uh, I'm bored in the house, bored in the house, bored, as well as pew, 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 hold up, wait a minute, it is a chopper. But more importantly, it has shown a magnifying glass on our strengths and weaknesses as societies and further amplified existing vulnerabilities in our structures. For no sector has this been more true than for education, for which the year 2020 has been a true year of revelation, even if what was uncovered was neither new nor surprising. At the height of the first wave of this global pandemic, 1.6 billion students around the world saw their education disrupted. Although the pandemic has impacted the health of millions of people globally, it has also affected almost every single home around the world as children's education was suddenly interrupted. With a snap of a finger over one night, countries who were prepared systemically, technologically, and with sufficient internet bandwidth managed to switch to distance learning almost seamlessly. However, while countries scrambled to move teaching online, only half of all those students were able to access continued quality learning opportunities through remote education. Children from disadvantaged families, from New York to Tokyo, Berlin to Cape Town, were left out. And those most vulnerable, like children from poor communities, girls, refugees, and children with disabilities, were left behind further. A learning crisis compounding an already existing learning crisis is now in our hands. But all is not lost, and there is a real chance to turn this crisis into an opportunity with education systems around the world emerging from the pandemic stronger than ever. In order for that to happen, it requires stakeholders from across the education sector and beyond to come together, share, and collaborate around what they have learned from this experimental year and use it going forward. It is in this new global context that Dubai Cares in collaboration with Expo 2020 Dubai and in close coordination with the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation has launched Rewired, a global education platform that hopes to reclaim the foundational role of education in achieving the global goals to ensure that our shared future is built on equity, powered by innovation and rooted in humanity. Through Rewired, we seek to unlock new solutions and innovations for the future of education by encouraging collaboration between new and unlikely allies while bringing together existing platforms and partnerships to, to amplify their impact. Rewired X is our first Rewired convening, serving as a one-year countdown to the Rewired Summit, which will take place in Dubai and in person next year in December at Expo 2020, which will probably be the largest uh, post-COVID gathering of humanity where um, countries come together and lay down their borders to solve the world's most pressing challenges. Over the next two days, you will hear from more than 80 different speakers, including ministers, high-level panelists, experts, funders, teachers, employers, and youth from over 40 different countries who will share their wisdom and explore and reflect on their frontline experience within the world of learning. Together, we will take stock of unprecedented year for education and map out ways forward for 2020 and well beyond. And just before I end, I really want to thank you all for uh, uh, your participation and tremendous support. Uh, I also want to thank our distinguished speakers, many uh, of whom I know personally and engaged with for many years and had dozens of discussions about the new reality post COVID-19. We must come together to take bold steps now to continue shining the light on the fundamental importance of resilient as well as quality education systems fit for the future 
and amplify the message that will, the, the, the world needs to hear. We need education. That's what they need to hear. It's the great equalizer now more than ever. I hope that Rewired X will be the uh, starting point for long-term uh, engagement and collaboration on new ways forward. Let's think differently, collaborate more effectively, and reach out to other sectors more uh, purposefully, because we know that uh, different outcomes can only come through, dif uh, through, through, through different actions. Enjoy the next two days. Enjoy the remarkable convening power of this virtual platform. And join me in praying that the internet network will be robust enough uh, and, and, and everything will run smoothly. And now I will leave you with a two minute video. It's an amazing, powerful video that will show you what we are embarking upon. Thank you very much. And now for the opening plenary of the Rewired X, a high level discussion that will ask key leaders in global education what impact COVID has had on education around the globe and what that would imply moving forward. This session will be moderated by Her Excellency Reem Al Hashmi, UAE Minister of State for International Cooperation, Director General of Expo 2020 Dubai Bureau and Chairperson of Dubai Cares. This panel features the following esteemed speakers. Her Excellency Lucia Azzolina, Minister of Public Education from Italy. His Excellency Dr. Mohammed bin Ahmed al Sideri, Saudi Vice Minister for Universities, Research and Innovation. The Right Honorable Gordon Brown, UN Special Envoy for Global Education. Julia Gillard, the Chairperson of the Global Partnership for Education. Henrietta H. Four, Executive Director of UNICEF. Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education from UNESCO, and last but not least, Mamta Murti, Vice President for Human Development of the World Bank. And now, Your Excellencies, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, to everybody who signed in and certainly to our incredibly esteemed group of panelists today. Um, it's an honor to be able to moderate this session. Um, and I'd like to begin by um, really with a, a few highlights. Uh, certainly COVID-19 has uh, disrupted the field of education in, uh, significant, uh, in significant ways. 
Um, more than uh, a billion students around the world have had no access to education uh, given uh, this COVID environment. And as a result, the gaps that have existed between uh, different um, systems has widened even further, uh, making it all the more uh, detrimental for children from poorer communities to be able to catch up. Uh, this lack of access to a digital connectivity um, has been further exacerbated by COVID. And there are other implications as well, whether it's um, around gender parity or around access to food, it's all compounded uh, through, uh, through COVID-19. Um, but as, as they also often say that in moments of such crisis uh, lies an opportunity to rebuild and uh, to redesign in a stronger way and in a more effective uh, 21st century skills, if you will, type of fashion. And so the spirit of today's session is to really bring the best minds around the world in their respective fields in different capacities to try to add a more value to our audience and to one another, how we could help redesign that in a better way. I do not know a single person who doesn't believe that education sits at the heart of anything sustainable, everything prosperous. Um, and so it is in that spirit that I hope today's 50 minute conversation uh, could lead to some uh, pretty good insights. The way we've um, tried to do this through, the, through a partnership between Dubai Expo 2020 and Dubai Cares, both entities I hope you're all quite familiar with, is to speak of rewiring education through the Rewired Education Summit, which we hope to be able to have the privilege to host next October here in the United Arab Emirates um, uh, in, uh, in the Expo site itself in the city of Dubai. And so uh, as we try to take stock of, of this year and as we try to look at uh, what is to come, we are uh, confident that we would only be able to do that in a collective fashion and also in a um, synchronized fashion together. And so with that, I'd like us to begin our 50 minute session with three main questions, which I will circulate across um, uh, the different panelists that we have, beginning with uh, His Excellency Gordon Brown. And uh, the question is, is as follows, and this is also a result of, um, the questions have been designed as a result of interaction we've been having with, with our stakeholders. And so it's, um, it, it's really around uh, at, at least the first one, and I'll read it as follows. In 2020, the provision of, of education as a basic right and as an essential public service was disrupted all around the world. Never has the education sector witnessed such a deep form of dis disruption at this enormous scale. Uh, we were all caught off guard, but some of us have coped better than others. What was something that surprised you with how countries responded? And what about the response of the international community? And what were the best responses and biggest gaps that you saw? Gordon, over to you. Well, first of all, can I say on behalf of all the excellent panelists who are here, uh, people I respect greatly, we want to thank you, uh, Minister Reem. We want to thank uh, UAE. We want to thank uh, Expo 2020 and Dubai Cares for organizing this event around the theme rewiring education and we all look forward to the events of Expo uh, next year that you're organizing. Thank uh, you. And we thank you for your personal interest, uh, particularly in digital technology and in international coordination. And I suppose what has shocked me during the last year is that while there have been so many great initiatives by individuals, by countries, by organizations, and many of them are represented here, the overall level of international coordination has not been good enough. I don't think we've come together on health or on uh, uh, the economy in, in a way that uh, could have made for a far better, a far better way forward uh, from the events uh, that have beset us. In 2009, we had a financial crisis and we had to act. In 2019-20, we've now got this health crisis and we've got to act not just to deal with the health problem, but to deal with the economic problem and now the educational problem. And so what I would like to see is uh, a strengthening of international cooperation at a leader's level, a government leader's level over the next year. And I think in education, I've spotted three 
uh, real problems. There are, you've got to be two steps ahead of events if you're thinking of the future. And one is there are going to be millions of children who need to catch up. And we need to put resources into making sure that the time they've lost in education is not time that is lost for good. Secondly, we know that technology has been inadequate. About a billion people who are children have had no access to the technology, even when we know there is a digital divide and we know that this was one way of contacting them. We've got to bridge that divide. And I know Henrietta has been working very hard and she'll talk about this, about how we can get every child linked up uh, to the internet for education. And I think the third thing, and I'll just finish here because there's so many people with great things to say, we now know there's a huge financing problem. So we are going to lose probably 150 billion from education budgets around the world over the next year. But by the time we get to Expo 20 in Dubai itself, let's see if we can have solved that problem. We'll have to do it by persuading governments not to cut education. We'll have to do it by international organizations, the IMF and the World Bank being able to do more. So they'll have to release more resources, special drawing rights, uh, debt relief in some cases, and we'll have to look at innovative finance because let's be honest, we cannot meet the sustainable development goal by 2030 that every child is in education, primary and secondary, unless we find more innovative ways of financing education and we've got ideas about how that can be done. So we are learning lessons all the time, but our international cooperation has got to be strengthened over the next year. And perhaps uh, what you're doing at uh, Dubai Cares and also at Expo 2020 can help us strengthen the international cooperation that we know UNESCO has been pressing for with its education forum. We've got the global education forum that we've also got an education that brings together people, but we need at a leaders of government level, far more pressure uh, to get education right to the top of the agenda and to get international action working with the resources needed. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, Henrietta, why don't you pick up from that and then we can um, hear also from, from Julia Gillard. Uh, thank you very much, Reem, and um, thank you, Gordon. And I join in with Gordon to say um, that we are enormously delighted that the rewired uh, uh, moment has come and that you have launched this. It's very important and it is timely, and we are all looking forward to next October being together in person. So what has struck me is um, the stark inequalities in our world. Uh, we have a world in which only half have connectivity, but people really responded with a new creativity. I mean, um, teachers began to think about how they could teach on television or on radio and what they could do over the phone with some of their students. Other students began helping younger brothers and sisters to learn things that they learned earlier and they became teachers. Most of us who are parents have learned how to be teachers, Reem, you know this. Um, from your own family. We all are being very creative and we are learning, but it's still not good enough. And so the countries that prioritized keeping schools open are the ones that I think are faring best in this uh, time of COVID. And to Gordon's point, the catching up of students is going to be a big issue for our world. There are some students who are going to have missed one year. A year of school is a very, very big leap for uh, children to be making. And uh, we need to do it. We need to get that education to everyone. I'm also impressed by some of the smallest countries who have done a really good job, like Timor-Leste. They decided that they would just get their national curriculum onto a platform. In this case, it's Learning Passport. And they then offered it to everyone in the country so that they continue to learn. Um, there were many creative uh, approaches, and it's something that we as a world need to learn. We cannot have a world in which half are connected, half are not connected, half go to school and half do not go to school. So um, we're learning as a world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I didn't know about the Timor-Leste um, example. I'll, I'll look into it some more. That's quite interesting. Uh, Julia, what are your perspectives? 
Thank you very much. And uh, Minister Reem, can I echo what Henrietta and Gordon have said? This is exactly the right thing at the right time. I'm very much looking forward to rewired as it rolls out. And I am hoping we can be together uh, in person during the course of next year. As wonderful as this technology is, it would be lovely to be together too. But thank you to you, uh, to the UAE, to the uh, Dubai Summit and to Dubai Cares for bringing us together this way. Uh, I don't want to repeat what Gordon and Henrietta have said. I absolutely agree with all of it. In your question, you've invited us to talk about some things that surprised us and worked well. I did want to point to uh, a thing that I think has uh, surprised in a good way, uh, that so many countries have learned the lesson from what happened during Ebola, particularly for the most marginalised children and the most marginalised girls. People knew from that experience that an epidemic and the closure of schools could well mean that the most marginalised children, particularly girls, never return to school and they are at risk of early marriage or at some other form of exploitation. And so GPE, as it has rolled out its emergency uh, 508 million US COVID fund, has seen nations like Rwanda and Madagascar uh, put gender at the heart of their response, making sure that they stay in touch with the most marginalised girls to try and keep them connected to education and to help ensure that they make a return to school. So that has been very important to see. I agree with Gordon that we absolutely need to see more leader level coordination. Uh, but I think that the education sector has been working together uh, in the rollout of uh, our GPE fund. We've relied profoundly on UNESCO. All of its data about school closures has meant so much. Uh, UNICEF's ability uh, amongst others, including the World Bank to move uh, funds and to make sure that they go uh, quickly to where they're needed the most, sometimes in the most difficult environments. All of this has been very precious to us. And so I think we've learned some lessons about coming together and coming together quickly. But in many ways, as hard as this year has been, some very profound challenges start, remain in front of us. Catching up the learning of individual children, absolutely. And as Gordon uh, points, the financing challenge uh, with government budgets constrained, uh, trying to keep education front and centre is going to be a heavy lift and one that we all need to do together and that Rewired can make such a contribution to. Thank you very much, Julia, for that. Can I um, quickly then dovetail to Dr. Mohammed from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia before um, speaking to Mamta and the World Bank and then to Stefania to, to close this first main question. Dr. Mohammed, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the organizing this conference. It is a pleasure to be part of this uh, opening session. Uh, also myself, I would echo what my colleagues said. Uh, let's just face uh, reality here. Uh, no one of us expected a global cr uh, crisis like this to be happening. There is no doubt uh, 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 the lockdown that's been uh, taking place everywhere, uh, no one uh, can see empty uh, streets uh, in London and Paris and everywhere in the world, in Saudi Arabia, all where, uh, where no one expected that uh, 1.6 million student, uh, students to be out of school because of uh, uh, close, uh, closures. Uh, and uh, if we just say that, uh, keep in mind, 90% of ministries of education put in a place some form of policies to provide digital and broadcast remote learning to ensure uh, adaptability as most students have access uh, and also uh, have assessed at their homes that would allow them to learn uh, remotely via digital or broadcast classes. Uh, what struck me the most is uh, seeing 
Uh, of course, uh, on the higher education, I think we don't have that difficulties. We, do, we did not face it. But on the general education, uh, really, we faced a lot of challenge. But what come out of these challenges is amazing. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we, can, we come out with uh, Madrasati, a new school platform. This is amazed work has been uh, uh, put in a place with a beautiful experience uh, and listen to be uh, learned from the outcome of that. Moreover, uh, on the general education, we saw some students, some teachers, they are providing a, beauti a beautiful solution. The, the quick adaptability to the technology, it's amazed us. Uh, in Saudi Arabia also, uh, with all this closure or with all this pandemic, uh, we also uh, reduced some of the uh, economy scales on uh, business, but Saudi Arabia put more into the education, put more uh, into the health. So uh, li uh, likely uh, to uh, close with this, uh, investment has been made really uh, to be come out of this uh, pandemic more strong. Uh, and a, a lot of lessons uh, will be uh, learning from each other. And I am uh, just uh, become uh, with what Mr. Brown just said, uh, we have really to come to exchange the experience, to exchange the resources so we can all learn from each other. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Um, Mamta, do you want to give us uh, the perspective from, from the World Bank before we close with Stefania, please? Uh, thank you very much, Reem. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you virtually, uh, and also a pleasure to meet many others uh, uh, in this forum who I haven't had a chance to meet personally. Um, I want to echo what has been said about this being a very timely uh, conversation about rewiring education. Um, what I am very struck by is um, in addition to a one, one in, once in a hundred year pandemic, um, uh, we are also facing a silent crisis uh, uh, in, in education because so many children are out of school. Um, we knew that there was a very large number of children out of school or learning poorly even before the pandemic. And now with so many children out of school, learning uh, remotely in a glass half full, glass half empty kind of situation, um, uh, we see a, a second crisis on, on top of the first crisis. So, so that's, the thing, that's the thing that is the most concerning uh, uh, to me uh, and, and to the World Bank at the moment. Um, the, the second uh, uh, thing I want to say is that, uh, um, and I, I think Henrietta made this point, uh, there are many good examples uh, of what countries have tried to do. Um, over 130 countries have put in some form of remote learning. Uh, often, because of the lack of, of uh, digital connectivity, this has been in the form of TV and, and radio. Uh, and I've actually been surprised at how good uh, some of these uh, TV shows and, and radio programs are. Um, and and there, um, uh, in Burkina, uh, to, to give you an example, uh, in, a, in a situation of conflict, um, uh, solar powered radios continue to provide some form of education for children who are out of school. Uh, and, and it's these examples that, that uh, if you like, give a, give a glimmer of hope that, that uh, things can continue and, and indeed things can get better. And, and um, I, I want to come to my third point, uh, which is, uh, 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 the one that Julia made, uh, I think there has been a realization uh, the world over that, that schooling and uh, education need to become more resilient and be prepared for a, for a situation uh, which has already arrived, a situation in which learning is blended between in-school instruction and instruction through, uh, delivered through remote means. And, and um, we, we've actually launched a couple of reports recently uh, to, to reimagine education and, and reimagine human connections and, and bring technology into education to support the delivery of instruction. Um, and, and, so, and so this conversation and this convening 
that can lead to this kind of improvement in the delivery of education is, I think, the way to go. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Mamta. Stefania. Thank you very much. So let me first of all. Stefania, we can't hear you for some reason. There we go. Yeah. I mute myself. Is it fine? <laughs> great. So yeah. just congratulating you uh, as my colleagues already done and uh, I'm very happy to, to be part of this inspiring conversation today. Well, what, uh, what definitely surprised me more, positively surprised, first governments, I should say, who, which responded with incredible speed, uh, I would say courage. Uh, they shown a real uh, thirst to learn from each other, to share experiences, uh, to partner each other. And I think that uh, this is very much the very first global uh, social experiment we are doing and uh, we can very very much build on this new kind of uh, intergovernmental uh, partnership that uh, we also from the international organization point of view uh, assist somehow. Second point is about uh, uh, the response of the international community, something that uh, Gordon, uh, Ariete, and all, all, all colleagues already mentioned. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, we, we've seen uh, all uh, international organizations we are representing also here today moving uh, in an agile way, in a startup mood, let me say like this, uh, GPE opening uh, in a short while, uh, a special fund uh, dedicated to uh, COVID-19 response in education, uh, uh, UNICEF, UNESCO, the World Bank, uh, for the first time, let me say, I suppose, not simply acting as one community, but thinking as one international community, providing guidance to governments uh, about uh, reopening schools safely, which is still a, a hot topic uh, uh, in, the, in the debate on education currently. So I think that uh, all these initiatives, the Global Education Coalition established by UNESCO, the Save Our Futures campaign uh, is a new kind of uh, thinking and working together with a common strategy. And I think really we have to, to build on that. Last point, I'm very much impressed, maybe not surprised, but impressed positively by the new way, the new perception we have of schools and teachers uh, as the, the locus of society, the place uh, uh, providing a public service which goes very much beyond uh, academic learning. Let me put it like this. And this has changed very fast. And the social value assigned today to education as a public good is the capital we have in our hands. And we have to build on that also about the question that Gordon mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, the need we have to mobilize leadership in the world at the highest level to invest in education now more than ever. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a, a great response uh, to, to the first question we've posed. And I think the way we tackle education globally, and as Stefania said, collectively through this one voice, is in many ways a manifestation of how international cooperation will have to also evolve um, as an overall principle. And frankly, I think there are enough voices on either side of the aisle as to whether or not we have demonstrated as an international community our ability to actually deliver on international cooperation in a manner that uh, makes us all very proud. And uh, not to get into a separate tangential debate, I think we'll get to it probably on, uh, as we close uh, today's session, but it is something, as Minister of International Cooperation, it is something that has kept me up at night in the sense that our business as usual approach to working with one another um, uh, uh, and also as a donor community and also with multilateral institutions and, and field operators on the ground is going to have to change for the better. And I think this type of an exchange and these types of insights can help reshape and redesign what that needs to look like 
because certainly, um, well, inshallah, as we say, uh, we will be able to uh, overcome COVID uh, with enough vaccines and enough access. And, and soon, I hope, very soon, I hope, we'll be able to put the, the pain of 2020 behind all of us as an international community. However, we will also be changed as a result of that. And that change should be and must be reflected in how we operate amongst ourselves, uh, but also with one another and the tools that are made accessible to us. Now, this is also compounded with what Gordon said earlier on, um, with an incredibly difficult economic crisis, which is going to dry up many funds uh, all around the world. And how we respond to that is going to be very telling uh, to also how we're going to recover and rebuild from this point onwards. But not to digress too much, um, and certainly not for me to start a monologue on my own. I always uh, make fun of moderators who end up taking the floor for too long. So I'll be a bit more disciplined on the second and third question. Uh, but I'd love to um, ask, um, and maybe we can start with Gordon again. Um, given that almost 50% of all primary and secondary students um, uh, being targeted exclusively for national online learning platforms did not have access to the internet. How can we make sure that the kids that are um, uh, marginalized or that do come from poor rural uh, communities, especially girls or children with disabilities, actually benefit from the potential of connectivity in education? So, so uh, I agree with everything you've said, uh, Your Excellency Minister Reem, about international cooperation. You've put it far better than I do, that we've got to find a way of working together. And that may mean more multilateral uh, financing and not just bilateral financing of aid projects. And uh, perhaps Julia might want to add to that because that's what the GP is about. Uh, I would uh, uh, refer this question in a way to Henrietta because she has been trying to bring people together in this great technology project so that every child has got access to the internet in one way or another by the different technological advances that have been made. Now, if we could uh, get the G20, which is the economic, uh, the premier economic uh, coordinating uh, body, uh, to take this up uh, during the Italian presidency next year, following on from the Saudi Arabia presidency this year, uh, then world leaders would become committed to, to, to if you like, wiring up the world or, or, or linking up the world through, through the internet. So I think this has got to be a global project. I think it's, um, yes, we want to help individual countries when they try to uh, take people onto the internet. And what you said about Timor-Leste and what we're hearing about other countries is really good. But can we make this a, a big global mission that yeah. the next time uh, we need everybody to be able to access education and information from home, uh, the, the facilities will be there. And it's a technological challenge that needs a financial backing. You need the G20 or a big organization like that to take it up as a big issue. And I think I should hand over to Henrietta because she will explain exactly what she wants to see done. So, so Reem, might I jump oh, in please. there? Because, Absolutely. Um, all right. So um, Gordon's right. This is a moment that we have as a world. And it is one in which we should not waste. So if the G7 and the G20 next year and the World Bank IMF meetings and the World Economic Forum can drive this as the number one issue, the issue that will change the world, bring equality, that will address your question, Reem. The most marginalized children just do not have a chance because they are not connected. But if we can connect every school in the world to the internet and every learner to learning, it will change the future of our world. It will give us a world in which everyone has an opportunity. So we've um, launched a Giga, a Gavi for Gigabytes, in which um, we are looking at low Earth satellites and at connectivity with fiber optic cable locally with uh, Wi-Fi on the top of every school. So just imagine that every school in the world is connected to, it, to the internet and that many devices will be given or at very low cost um, shared with teachers and with students, that there are um, IT companies and telephone companies that are offering services that are free or zero based for downloading of educational material. It means then that what the world would have at its um, fingertips is 
uh, education and learning, good quality education, something that Mamta and, and um, Stefania and uh, Julia and I have all been working very hard on. There are many online tools that now are good quality for children at every age. And if we can map every school in the world, we currently have mapped 800,000 schools. We want to map all of them. We've done it now in 30 countries. There are another 15 countries coming on. Dubai Cares has been terrific. We are celebrating that Dubai Cares has invested to link six countries, six new countries to this. But if we could connect every school in the world to the internet, coming out of COVID, our world will be different. And as uh, Stefania said, we're all now thinking together and we can see that this needs doing and our educators are hard at work on what the best quality is so that we can reach all of these marginalized groups because there is a gender divide, there is a economic divide, but we could overcome it. The technology is now there, the world is there. If we can catch the attentions of the world leaders and if we can get the financing behind it as Gordon and Julia and Mamta are all talking about. Thank you very much for that, Henrietta. Julia, do you want to take up from Henrietta, please? Uh, ve very briefly, uh, what Henrietta has outlined is a breathtaking vision for change, and I endorse it absolutely. Uh, what we have learned from this year is just how pressing the digital divide is. We knew it before we came into 2020, but now in 2020, we've seen in an urgent pressurised situation what it means that so many children have been able to sustain their learning uh, using this technology. But by the time we turn to sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, UNESCO statistics tell us that only one in 10 children has access to the internet. So so wholly endorse what Henrietta has just said. What we have found at the Global Partnership for Education working in this environment where there is poor connectivity in so many places is that countries have sought to innovate. Uh, they have innovated around paper-based solutions, the delivery of things like um, learning tools, including learning tools specifically for children with disabilities. Uh, we've seen that in Gambia, for example. Uh, we've seen in Malawi uh, innovation where there are solar powered tablets that have got preloaded content uh, that don't need connectivity to keep providing uh, children with learning. Uh, but if we could leap to the vision that Henrietta is talking about, then obviously that would completely change the game. I do want to remind, though, that whilst the technology is critically important, the technology needs teachers to make it come alive. And if I can just pick up on uh, Gordon's uh, systems transformation point, if we are going to transform education right around the world so that every child is in school and learning, we need not only to invest in the technology, but we need to be investing in high quality teaching. And I think this year has taught us that if we want to do big things, then we need to do them at massive scale. We've measured the number of kids forced out of school in, you know, billions, you know, more than a billion. Uh, well, if you're going to make a difference to life chances for children when you're talking about that kind of number, it's challenging us to move beyond a project modality to be backing in more strongly multilateral action and to be backing in more strongly whole system transformation so that we make a difference for every child. Dr. Mohammed, can you speak a little bit about the G20, given that the Kingdom just closed um, on its uh, uh, hosting of that, and, and just speak a little bit to um, how you are seeing the future of investment into the education sector on a multilateral level as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but before I go, uh, uh, to say about this, I would just emphasize on the uh, ability of our uh, human capability on the creativity uh, where we can really uh, overcome all the difficulties that faced us. Uh, luckily today we are uh, meeting remotely because of 
the innovation and creativity of the human being. So that's what will help us. There is no doubt uh, the digital gap between uh, rich and poor, uh, digital gap between uh, 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 generation will be different uh, today than before. Uh, now we can see uh, more countries uh, facing some of the uh, difficulties, other not. Uh, Electronic connectivity, it's not the only way where we can have the learning. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, we have 25 channels, TV channels, where we can reach people with poor connectivity. So this is a good example where uh, a poor uh, country or uh, uh, connectivity difficulties face some countries. They can go beyond the uh, internet and so on by having these kind of channels. Back to your question uh, on uh, G20 and Saudi Arabia. As you know, uh, the education uh, working group was first in, uh, included in the G20 agenda on uh, 2018 under the uh, Argentinian presidency, and it was uh, reintroduced under the uh, Saudi presidency to build a brief discussion on uh, and advances our uh, commitment to education. Accordingly, in 2020, Education Working Group chose to focus on the two key uh, priorities. One, early childhood education as a foundation of the developing global uh, competence and 21st century skills. And second is the internationalization in education. Uh, however, uh, the Education Working Group later introduced uh, the third topic, in response to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the education worldwide, uh, education continuity on the time of crisis. Uh, throughout the year, the delegates from uh, G20 uh, countries and invited guests collaborated to develop the 2020 Riyadh Education Ministerial uh, Community and uh, working on the outcome relevant to the three priorities. However, special focus uh, was going to the impact of COVID-19 on the education sector. Uh, we are today uh, really, uh, I, I don't want to take more of the talk because I think you are about to reach the closing time and I would like to keep some space for my colleague to have uh, their say. Thank you, Dr. That's really considerate. I do want to wrap up around um, investment and effective investment and um, really dovetail this question on marginalized communities uh, for Mamta and also for Stefania to speak, it, speak about it through the prism of what are the most effective forms of um, investment in 2021. Um, in this particular sector, and then open that up to Gordon and, and, and Henrietta, and also Julia as well. So, uh, Mamta, why don't you uh, speak to us, certainly from the prism of the World Bank, given the amount of research that, that you do, and given the amount of what you call best buys in education, where should we be funneling our, um, our uh, financial investment uh, in your perspective? Um, thank you, Reem. Uh, I, I want to begin by saying I, I completely endorse what Henrietta, uh, the vision that Henrietta is putting forward about a reimagined, connected uh, education system. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, bearing in mind um, Julia's point that teachers need to be enabled uh, to, uh, they're at the heart of this transformation and they need to be enabled to deliver this, this transformed uh, uh, education. Um, now, there's a, uh, let me come to your question. There's been an explosion of good evidence uh, uh, on what works in education in the past 20 years or so, and, and understanding it, um, uh, understanding what context it, it's being produced in, how relevant it is to, to other countries, is something that's, that's a full-time job, and, and we don't see um, ministries of education or, or uh, technical staff uh, um, being able to comprehend uh, and digest all of this. And, and that's why in, in collaboration with UK Aid, we've convened what we're calling a global education evidence advisory panel. It's a long, uh, it's got a long name. We've come up with an acronym. And, and the idea really is to get together the best minds, um, uh, the best researchers and and put them together with policymakers who've contributed in real life 
to, to bringing about change and come up with recommendations on, on what, could be, what could be some good buys, some smart buys um, uh, uh, in education. And um, uh, I want to link it to the conversation that we're having about reimagining education and, 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 and uh, um, uh, closing the digital divide. Uh, one thing, uh, one piece of evidence that's coming up from this panel is that standard large scale teacher training can deliver little or no benefit. And, and this is very relevant because as, as, as Julia uh, and others have pointed out, teachers are, are at the heart of education. At the same time, the, the standard way of delivering teacher training doesn't actually help much. What seems to help is, is practical training um, given to teachers focused on improving the quality of teacher-student interaction. Um, it is the case today that in most developing countries, there's a huge uh, uh, diversity in, in actually how much uh, children know and can learn in the classroom. So teachers have to adapt the way in which they teach. And um, in addition to giving them practical training on how to teach better, very simple assessment tools that will allow them to assess whether children have learned whether children have progressed from the knowledge that they came in uh, to the classroom, whether they've progressed from that and what more they need can actually improve uh, learning outcomes. So two smart buys uh, based on, on this work is, is practical training focused on improving the teacher-student interaction uh, and um, tools that help uh, teachers teach at the right level. So simple assessment tools that, that help them understand whether where where children are at and how much they've learned can really deliver a huge payoff and in terms of learning outcomes. That's fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, Stefania? Yes, uh, very briefly, I see three, um, three musts, uh, so to say. First, as already mentioned by Marta and I fully endorse the picture she she figured out uh, it's about uh, investing in teachers first and mostly in their safety, in their well being, uh, training, professional development. And let me say, I really don't think we can say now in this crisis mostly technology going to replace them, but using technology to empower them. Second point, uh, let me say, a bit, say about the, the evolution of the right to education. This, uh, this week we are, go, we, are, we are coming from celebrating the uh, first uh, convention, global convention about uh, discrimin uh, discrimination in education and affirming the right to education. And uh, the right to education is now irreversibly, in my opinion, and twinned everywhere with connectivity and access to technology. So it's about investing in digital inclusion in the full sense of this word. And uh, I think we must ensure that technology, how can I say, adapts the, the, the learners in their diversity and not, and not learners as many times we said in the past uh, to be adapted to technology. Finally, I think uh, almost obvious, but uh, it's important to underscore this point is about uh, investing in the most marginalized groups and contests. We don't, uh, we have not to forget refugees uh, and the huge impact of this crisis on this part of the uh, of the education uh, uh, global population. Uh, girls, uh, as uh, Julia already mentioned, uh, and the impact on on gender equality. So the most vulnerable and marginalized groups must be taken into account. And definitely a last point I care so much. Let me put it like this. It's not in my opinion about investing exclusively in, uh, in academic learning. It's very much about uh, uh, investing uh, on the relationship between learning and the world what in our technical language uh, in education uh, uh, in a 2030 agenda SDG4 we call mission uh, 4.7. That means uh, global citizenship education, education for sustainable development. I mean, the function that education uh, can have in order to transmit a new kind of knowledge, awareness and behaviors in a young generation and uh, being young generation, the very 
the very must uh, a first generation to change this world and to affirm a new kind of uh, uh, model of development that is very about the 2030 agenda uh, as a whole uh, purpose. Over. Um, thank you very much. Julia, would you like to maybe speak a little bit on this front as well, on the um, kind of priority sector or priority areas of education um, uh, that we need to invest in for something more inclusive? And then I'd love to have uh, Gordon speak about um, how uh, when they hosted the G20 during the financial recovery, uh, they managed to create a blueprint at that time. And he kind of alluded to this in the beginning and what would 2021 look like? Um, then I would uh, love to close with a video from the Minister of Education in Italy. So uh, if you don't mind, Julia, I'd love to hear your perspectives on this. I'm sure we all would. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and I'll be brief. I know time is uh, tight. Uh, I absolutely endorse uh, what Mamta has said about the pivotal role of teachers. And if we're looking at best buys, transformative ways of changing education, investing in teachers. And I also agree with Stefania, uh, girls' education we know is a huge priority if we are going to uh, pitch our education at leaving no child behind, then we have to be focusing on girls' education. If I was going to nominate a third, uh, it would be early childhood education from the GPE perspective. Uh, that is looking at the year before school and school preparedness. Uh, UNICEF and others work on early childhood education uh, at the lower age ranges, but it is so important to a child's development uh, that they are learning during those early years and that the brain wiring and brain connections are happening. But I would remind, we know from our own experiences that education works as a whole system. Every part is connected to every other part. If one bit fails, if the teacher training fails, if the curriculum development fails, if the uh, connectivity isn't there, if the education infrastructure isn't there, if the um, circumstances to enable the most marginalised children to come out there, then the system won't work for all, which is why uh, we, as a partnership, as well as a fund, think it is so important to come together globally, but also at country level to ensure that countries are working through the development of robust and inclusive plans for education and then delivering them so that we can see change at scale. Uh, next year is going to be a pivotal year for the education community. We've got to uh, protect education budgets. We've got to increase resourcing. Uh, GPE's got its replenishment coming up in 2021. Uh, but of course, that is not the only challenge. As Henrietta has pointed out, there's the technology challenge and making sure that we keep education front and center is going to require a collective lift uh, which is why I think the institutions like the G20, like the G7, when leaders come together, are going to be so important. Thank you for that. Um, Gordon. Yes, and you've already, I think, by your brilliant chairmanship of this event, created an agenda for rewired. Yeah. <laughs> And so I, I think uh, we, we know what we've got to discuss over the next year, uh, technology, the role of teaching, the importance of resources for teaching and so on. But let me just say about the G20 and uh, the organization of international action. At the beginning of next year, the rescue operation in a sense has happened. It's now the recovery and we need to have a, a recovery initiative taken by the, the, the leaders of the world. So it's got to be a global recovery, global growth, global recovery. Now, part of that global recovery initiative must be the centrality of education, because education unlocks health, it unlocks gender equality, it unlocks sustainable development, it unlocks employment opportunity. So we have got to find a way of all coming together, the brilliant people who are here uh, today, coming together to persuade the leaders of the world that the part of that recovery initiative, and you've got to be single-minded about this, has got to include substantial investment in education. And when I hear the, the talk about you know, technology 
uh, uh, obviously does not substitute for teachers. It, it, it strengthens teachers and it makes teachers even more important because you can see the role of the teacher as tutor becoming really significant uh, when you have the technology to back that up. It's as the Save Our Future document that UNESCO was involved in says, it's about high touch, high tech, and that's the way forward. So let us try and persuade the major uh, global institutions that as part of the recovery fund, education has got to be central to it. And let us focus particularly on the people that have just been mentioned. Uh, girls, we must avoid a big rise in child marriage that will hurt a generation of young girls. Refugees, only 1% get to higher education. We must do better. But then there's the 800 million that the world have identified, the learning poor, those who can't read or write at the age of 10 or 11 and leave school whenever they leave without any qualifications that are of use to them. We must have a recovery fund that says the employment opportunities of these young people depend on us investing in their skills and education. And I think we should make that central, uh, just as environment and climate change is at the center of the recovery, so too should be education. And I think by the time we get to uh, Dubai next year, uh, with the work that Tariq and you are doing uh, so brilliantly to organize for that, perhaps we can have a discussion about how that recovery fund is going to be used uh, for educational advancement. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, certainly by October next year, I hope we would have capitalized on the first few quarters of 2021 to really design something that makes sense, uh, because as, as difficult as 2020 has been or is, I think 2021 could have even more impact than ever before um, or than, than ever anticipated. But let me, um, let me give the opportunity for a video message from the Minister of Education from Italy before I make some quick closing remarks. Um, Nicola, uh, if you don't mind helping us with the tech and putting that video up for everybody to enjoy. Dear ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to participate in this meeting focused on education's contribution to a prosperous and sustainable future for all. Italy strongly believes that investing in quality education is one of the pillars of economic growth, sustainable development and shared prosperity. The pandemic crisis in which our educational systems have proven to be seriously endangered with the risk of a generational catastrophe can also be seen as an opportunity to redefine our educational systems and to make them more resilient and ready to face future challenges. In the last difficult months, Italy has contributed to the global reflection on ensuring the continuity of education and resilience and recovery of our economies and societies. Strongly believing in the multilateral approach, we have collaborated with our partners in all regional and international fora. That is why Next year, Italy will take advantage of uh, all the opportunities to continue to support knowledge sharing in all areas of education, starting from the Italian presidency of the G20, when there will be a dedicated ministerial meetings to important exhibition of Expo 2020 Dubai, where Several educational events will be hosted inside and outside the Italian pavilion involving the participation of students from all over the world. In this respect, I would like to thank our host country, the United Arab Emirates, Expo 2020 Dubai organizers and the Italian Commissioner for Expo 2020 and all other international partners such as UNESCO, who are already active in ensuring the participation of schools and students within the initiatives which we are considering for the next year in the context of the Expo 2020 and the G20. 
and wish this, I wish a great success to the rewired Global Summit on Education promoted by Dubai CARES in cooperation with Expo 2020 Dubai and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you very much uh, to the minister from Italy, uh, Ms. Lucia Asolina, uh, for that recorded message. Um, as, we, as we close, uh, and as all of you know, Dubai Expo 2020, uh, which will be held next October in 2021, October 1, 2021, is focused on connecting minds, creating the future. Everything that we've all heard um, speak to uh, how to connect people together. And I believe, and I'm sure you would all agree, that this year we truly recognized our common humanity um, as, uh, as a family on earth um, and as a human species as well. I think the challenge ahead is that there will be many calls for help, um, whether it is our own uh, domestic uh, economic environment or it's healthcare, or climate, or famine, um, the request for support um, is going to uh, skyrocket um, as everybody reels and tries to recover from what this pandemic has left behind, or maybe even will still be leaving behind, because we very much will still be in a pandemic for at least the, the first or second quarter of next year. As I think through um, 365 days from now, uh, which is when we'll actually be hosting the Rewired Summit in Dubai, and we'll be hosting the Knowledge and Learning Week, I can't only hope that we would have made significant traction uh, because as, as powerful um, an emotion as hope is, I think the stakes are quite high for much more than that, or rather in addition to that. And it is certainly a time for very bold, very courageous, um, very collective action uh, that is very much leadership driven to coalesce us as an international community in the belief and conviction of the, not just importance of international cooperation, but the no alternative other than international cooperation mindset uh, to truly, um, uh, Henrietta left us, but I'd like to leave with, with the statement she used repeatedly, which is to reimagine education as we reimagine what our world will look like. Um, there is no shortage of talent out there and certainly no shortage of experience uh, from, from panelists today, but, but also um, uh, those who, who aren't with us. And to speak of a system transformation, which is really the only way, and Julia said it very well as well, by bringing on board the, the large institutions of G7, G20, GPE, et cetera. Um, I, think, I think trying to coalesce everyone around that unified vision that is bold and big and frankly scary, uh, but necessary to be able to curb the, um, the, the impact of COVID and to mitigate all of these other intervening factors and they're not, they're no small things, these intervening factors. I mean, when you speak of famine and how 270 million additional people uh, are going to be at the brink of starvation and likely not make it as a result of COVID and add all other uh, accumulated metrics to that, um, you're really looking at a compounded crisis in humanity, not only in the education sector alone. And so, I, um, I take it upon uh, myself and my team, both at Expo and also at Dubai Cares, to do more than just advocate and talk about this, but to truly escalate it so that we may all rise to the occasion uh, next year with something that could uh, truly articulate that we have not simply um, hosted something powerful, but we've been able to leave 
a powerful impact as well. I, I again thank you all for, for joining me. It has been an absolute privilege. I hope and I know we'll have our own side and offline conversations about today's session. And I uh, want you to also all know how grateful we are here in the UAE to have friends and partners we can, we can call upon to convene in this manner uh, as you so readily did. Uh, so thank you for that. And I uh, would like to take the opportunity to wish you all a very special holiday and a very special Christmas and New Year's with your family and with your friends um, in a safe way. And hopefully 2020 uh, will be the year we can all rise together. Thank you again very much. Thank you, His Excellency. Thank you. Thank you so much.